So uh, let me again uh, thank uh, Professor Ibrahim Karimi for agreeing to give this talk series. We have a, we had a very nice uh, uh, talk on Monday, and uh, this is in uh, uh, continuation of that. So again, for those who have joined, uh, uh, you know, uh, today for the first time, this is a talk which is a quick 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 talk series supposed to be at the very tutorial level. And uh, you know, people who are interested in a very broad area of quantum information uh, should find it kind of interesting. So it should have a tutorial as well as some exciting, uh, you know, experimental results in, in this field. So uh, uh, again, for those who have joined today, let me just introduce the speaker. And there's always pleasure <laughs> introducing him again, again and again. So I, I don't think I get tired. Okay, so Professor Karimi has a, a BS in Physics 2001 from University of Kerman, Iran, and then MS in 2003 uh, from Institute of Advanced Studies, University of uh, Kerman, again in Iran, and PhD in 2009 from University of Naples, Italy. Uh, he's currently a Canada Research Chair Professor at the University of Ottawa in Canada. Uh, I mean, he does, he's interested in so many things, but he says that his research focuses on, uh, you know, in, in some total structured quantum waves and their applications in quantum information. So he has several papers, about 150 in all major journals, including science, nature, nature physics, PRL, nature photonics. Uh, he has three patents. He's a member of several societies, including Royal Society of Canada, Global Young Academy. He's a fellow of Optical Society of America. Well, I think the Optical Society of America, the name has changed. You, you told me last time, but I forget, I forget again. Uh, so what, what is the new name? Optica. Optica, okay. So that is Optica, uh, and it, previously it was OSA, Optical Society of America. He's also a visiting fellow at uh, Max Planck Institute of Science of Light, and again, fellow of several other societies, several prizes uh, to his names. Uh, I'll name a few, Ontario Ministry Early Researcher Award in 2018, University of Ottawa Earlier Early Researcher Award in 2019, and Canadian Association of Physicists Herzberg Medal in 2020. Uh, he has been an associate editor of, uh, he was an associate editor of New Journal of Physics until 2020. And currently he is an associate editor of um, uh, Optics, Optics Express since uh, 2016. So, so with that, let me, uh, and again, this I mentioned last time, I'll, I'll mention this time as well. So he, his, he started his um, research in uh, string theory, uh, proper string theory, but now he's doing quantum optics experiments. So, so this, this basically tells you how exciting this field is. <laughs> That people from string theory are moving to uh, <laughs> moving to quantum optics. So people who are deciding on the research career, uh, you know, PhD career, can get a hint from uh, here. So okay. So with that, let me hand it over to Professor Karimi. So yeah. Thank you very much, Anand, uh, uh, for the for the introduction and also for the invitation. So uh, today we will follow uh, the the previous lecture. And essentially, I, I, I should apologize to those people which uh, they know the field. But however, as Professor Alan mentioned, that it, it is worth sometimes to to uh, to go through the fundamentals again, uh, again, and and reviewing some of those uh, you know basic physics, but because sometimes you will get new ideas. Um, so today, yesterday, uh, a day before yesterday on Monday, we we stopped here. Uh, uh, that how uh, the orbital angular momentum can be generated. We talk about the spin angular momentum, which is coordinate independent, and orbital angular momentum, which is coordinate dependent. And by the way, you will see it not on Friday, but next time when Professor Nanandi will ask for giving a lecture. This is not only. Uh, uh, limited to photon, these properties we'll, we'll discuss about that can be associated to any massive particle, uh, massless and massive particles. So, um, uh, but so far, I mean, we like photons because most of the quantum optics experiment can be done with photons easily. We the development that we got it, and. Uh, we can we can reach to these certain points, uh, which we can test many of those uh, fundamental issues and fundamental uh, fundamental problems. Uh, however, recall that wave is wave, uh, and uh, uh, wave is wave, and 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 when you have something for light can, that can apply to electron, can do neutron, 
to protons and etc. And we will discuss about it on the fourth lecture, which uh, Professor Anand will, will kindly arrange this. Uh, how it, it, let's, let's go back to the photon and we talk that photon can carry spin angular momentum and orbital angular momentum. Spin is associated with the vectorial nature of light and uh, uh, orbital angular momentum is associated, uh, uh, associated to, to how we shape the phase of the beam. Aruchi has kindly shared with me a, a manuscript by uh, my colleagues, Miles and, and Johannes. We will discuss about that, Aruchi, later, maybe after the lecture, uh, uh, how even that astigmatic approach or astigmatism approach can also impart OM, but uh, that's a completely different scenario. Going back to the OM, so we say that you can, one way that you can shape it is essentially uh, using a spiral face plate which means that uh, you have different thicknesses and different thicknesses, they impart different uh, phase. And then when the light is traveling through these, let's say plate, which the plate is uh, uh, um, inhomogeneous. So some part is a lower thickness and some part is a uh, higher thickness. Then when the light is exiting from the part that is lower thickness is exiting earlier, while the part that is, uh, is more thick then exits a little bit later. So it, it goes to be on that right. And with this technique, you will, you will impart OM to the beam. However, remember that uh, if you want to create a, a specific L values, then let's say this form of staircase, the jump in the staircase, which happens here, that should be in order of wavelength. That was the reason that the first experiment uh, uh, by using the spiral face plate was done in the microwave because these control that you need to, to do it uh, um, requires engineering, proper engineering, and that could be done with a with microwave easier than visible light. Uh, there, there is another way to generate orbital momentum, which is a beautiful, and uh, it was proposed even before people, they were talking about orbital momentum. It was done in 1990, and uh, this is uh, a way that people, they were thinking about creating phase singularity. And that was a beautiful work, uh, work of Marat Soskin and colleagues in, in Ukraine, which uh, uh, unfortunately we lost Marat last year. Uh, uh, and he, uh, he trained a lot of uh, great scientists in the field of singular optics. How that techniques works, essentially uh, you do have a beam with the beam, yes. Any question? Okay, so you do have a beam which is coming at the angle, okay? Uh, the question is that how do, can we create orbital angular momentum beam? So a beam that carries OM. So they say that, look, I didn't know how to create this beam, but I know what is the mathematical expression for this beam. I know what is the mathematical expression for the orbital momentum carrying beam. I will do an interference coherently with another beam, which is a reference beam for me. This is what we call it holographic way. And I do the interference between these two beams, the reference beam and the beam that carries orbital momentum on, uh, 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 on uh, 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 not in real by, by doing some simulation. So you can do computer generated holograms. So you have a reference beam, which this is the reference beam that we do have. Usually people, they know that if you have a zero to two pi phase, uh, this means that uh, you have a change in the phase. So this is zero, this is two pi, this is four pi, this is six pi and etc. If you look at the, the, the red part, and between you will see this is pi, this is three pi, and, uh, and five pi, and seven pi, okay? So if you look at that beam, and I'm telling you, hi guys, what does this beam look like? It's a, it's a planar wave, or let's say Gaussian wave, but does not come to me, towards me, but it comes at the angle, because it's a linear function. If you see that the, the phase is changing linearly, so it means that the, the beam is coming, at angle uh, with respect to a, an axis which I do have. So it is x, y axis, and this is it. And the beam that I do have, it's coming at a specific angle with respect to me. 
So this is a reference beam that I do have. And the beam that carries orbit and momentum has a, a, this structure, if you remember. So this is the beam that carries orbit and momentum and it's coming exactly towards you. And if you do the coherent superposition of these two together, summing up the phase, this is the pattern that you will get it for the phase. So essentially interference pattern of the two beam will be something like a, like a pitchfork, okay? And if you see that uh, the fringes that usually we get, so if you do interference of two beams, which they are coming at the angle, they are both planar and or Gaussian, then the fringes that you will get, usually they are dark and bright uh, fringes. These, for example, dark uh, fringes, and they are linear. If you change the angle between the two, essentially you will get either smaller fringes or much bigger fringes, okay? or much bigger fringes. But what, what is clear that always what you have, you have a straight fringes. So they are straight line fringes. Here, the fringes that you will get, since there is a phase singularity at the origin, then you will get, uh, 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 then you will get uh, 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 a dislocation. And the fringes, they are not any more planar. At the periphery, they are planar, but when it comes to the origin, one fringe becomes multiple fringes, depending on the phase jump that you do have it here. For example, here is a phase jump of uh, uh, two, 2 pi, because it's changing from 0 to 2 pi, and 2 pi again to 4 pi. So then essentially, you will get two fringes here, more than the standard one. So this is the approach that people, they use it to create an OM carrying beam with a computer. So essentially on the computer, you do the simulation, you create this hologram. When you have the hologram, even you can take a picture of that and then uh, you can have the, like the holograms that usually we use. Uh, we do have it also on the money of Canada. And then, uh, uh, then you, uh, you place it in front of a laser and you will get that uh, the beam that carries orbit and momentum. So essentially, uh, in nature, also these these locations appear in many places. For example, you do it in zebra. And uh, the, uh, if I want to show to you that what is happening in laboratory, uh, this is the hologram that we uh, I just described it to you. It's a pitchfork hologram. It can be amplitude hologram. It can be phase hologram. It can be amplitude and phase hologram together. And then you, when you go with the Gaussian beam, due to the fringes that you do have it there, you will have diffractions. And if you look at the first order of diffraction, what you will get, you will get a beam that has this phase that is imprinted here. And this is the orbital momentum of two. And if you go to the upper, other side, due to the symmetry that we do have, you will get uh, orbital angular momentum of minus two carrying beam, okay? And uh, uh, this is very well-known technique, and this is widely used in the community of orbital momentum and, and light beam shaping. And, uh, and also, the same approach can be used to add or subtract OM to a beam. So for example, in the previous case, what we had, if you go with a Gaussian beam in the at the first order of diffraction here, if you go with L equal to zero, then what it does, this hologram, it added, uh, and let me do something different name. If your beam carries orbital, in, uh, orbital momentum of M, then uh, the hologram action will be adding a value of two to the diffracted beam. So here, M is equal to zero. Then on the other side, you will get uh, uh, orbital momentum of two uh, imprinted to the beam. M can be any value, and this is the approach that people, they use it to detect specific orbital momentum values. For example, if you go with L equal to minus two, then uh, the action, so here is M equal to minus two, then uh, the hologram, what it does, it adds two value to the OM value, uh, to the OM of the initial beam, then you will get L equal to zero on the first order of diffraction. 
So the hologram essentially what it does at the first order of diffraction, it uh, added the, uh, the OM value to the initial beam, okay? So uh, uh, this is the way that also people, they use it to detect orbital momentum, and we will discuss that in details uh, uh, in about, let's say, maybe 10, 20 minutes. Fantastic. So um, um, on Friday, I will talk about the quantum optics experiment, which is done with, orbital, uh, with OM carrying beam and the importance of those uh, 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 applications. However, it is worth to, to notice some of, the, uh, some of the important applications that so far we know, and we will go through details of some of them. For example, uh, it can be used in astronomy. So uh, when you look at the stars, when you look at the planets, you will get a lot of noises from, from the background. And there are many techniques that people they are developing and they call it coronography. What they do, they want to remove the noise and they want to, they want to see explicitly a specific planet or specific uh, 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 star. So this holographic and te coronographic technique is, is based on how we can filter or we can impart some specific filter to, to the beam that is coming or to the light that is coming to our telescope. So uh, one of my uh, good colleague, uh, um, Schwarz Lender, uh, what, what he did and he proposed uh, uh, in, in 2005 uh, was using a, a mask and this mask was uh, L equal to two carrying orbital momentum. So essentially, Assuming that you do have one of those spiral plates, uh, if you remember the, the spiral plate that we just discussed about that, uh, but the phase step, let's say, it is such a way that it, uh, 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 it, it imposes orbital momentum of two. And if you place it here, what it does, if you do a little bit of calculation, you will see that, uh, um, uh, it, 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 it takes away the, the background light and it sends this to the really to, to outside of the region that you are looking for. So what, uh, this, this is the experiment they did with this uh, mask, which is a standard mask that people they use in uh, astronomy. And then they place M equal to one and they wanted to see what is happening with the, with the uh, spiral phase plate, which is imparting orbital momentum of one. You will see that uh, the, this is the place that they are expecting to see, let's say, the planet or the, the object. And for M equal to two, what they have seen that the noise that was there, as you see in, the, in this uh, image, the noise is completely canceled out and you can see only the astronomical object that you are looking for. And M equal to three, if you place another phase object, then you will, you will see that the noises start to appear. So this was a, a fantastic application of uh, orbital momentum. And I, I think after that, they have done so many experiments in this direction. And uh, just to tell that the part that you have the phase singularity playing a crucial role. So what is the size that you can have uh, the, uh, the staircase essentially? Uh, another application, as we discussed, is, uh, uh, is, uh, is uh, optical manipulation. So uh, as we, we discussed in, in, uh, in the first lecture, there were, by the way, some of those movie, movies that were taken by Miles Paget uh, uh, and Jonathan Leach and other colleagues in, in Glasgow, uh, maybe even from the Kishan Dolakias team. And uh, then you can see that using orbital momentum, you have the possibility to transfer a mechanical motion to an object. You can, you can start to, to rotate the object around the specific beam axis, or uh, what you can do also, you can create optical pumps. So essentially by using the speed angular momentum, uh, this is what I showed, uh, I think last time we discussed about that, you have a sequel position, uh, a beam or beam carrying secret position uh, right-handed and a beam carrying secret position left-handed. They are coming to uh, a microsphere. The microsphere 
for example, if they are halfway plate, what they do, they flip the polarization of light. So they go from left-handed to right-handed. Then uh, there is a transfer of orbit and momentum because the system is cylindrical, is symmetric. Then uh, a two h bar angular momentum will be transferred to the object. For this one, it will be uh, it will be going clockwise, and for this one, they will go counterclockwise. So any if there is a fluid between them, you can you can create a, a, a flux here, which you can you can make a pump with it. Okay. Then uh, the other application, which uh, I'm sure that most of you, you are familiar with, is a state microscopy, which uh, Stefan Hell got the Nobel Prize for it. Uh, in this microscopy, essentially, I mean, we know that the resolution of any microscope is limited by, by, by the wavelength that you use uh, to, to extract the information. Okay, this is what we call it Rayleigh curse or you can call it even the limit, the Heisenberg limit that we do have. Uh, essentially, for example, if I want to create, a, I want to get a resolution of, let's say, uh, um, uh, uh, my, let's say, uh, nanoscale uh, resolution, then I have to go with the beam, which the wavelength, uh, or going with the, with the particle beam, which the wavelength is, is close to nanometer scale. Uh, I cannot, for example, go with a blue light, which is almost, roughly speaking, about 400 nanometer wavelength and getting a resolution of 10 nanometer. This is forbidden in physics. So, uh, in, uh, Stefan Hell had a fantastic proposal, and the proposal is based on the size of the singularity. So, essentially, the size of singularity for the beam that we talked, I mean, for the donut beam, where, the, the, let's say, the zero intensity is located, uh, uh, or null intensity is located is essentially uh, uh, is a mathematical point. So essentially is zero. In practice is depending on how good your spiral faceplate is, your hologram is and other stuff. So uh, he uses this approach and he had what we call it a depletion uh, in the beam. So he has an excitation field and he has another beam which we call it the uh, simulate uh, um, state, my state beam, and then uh, um, when you superimpose them together, this is what you will get essentially along the beam axis. I'm oh, sorry, I have to go in opposite way along the beam axis. So you superimpose the two two together, and they are pulse laser. Essentially, the one uh, uh, if you will go with the state beam, which is the donut beam. You will excite the sample. So all part of, let's say that you have intensity, the, 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 um, uh, the dye will be excited. And if you go with excitation field, which is superimposed with the, with the donut beam, then only from the region that the state beam is not, uh, it doesn't have intensity, you will, get, uh, you will get the images. So you will get only from the point that you have zero intensity. And uh, the resolution that you will get, for example, if you even use, um, uh, uh, let's say, uh, 533 nanometer wavelength, then the resolution that you will get it is about 20 nanometer, which is way, way below the Rayleigh criteria. This is uh, an amazing approach that you can, you can get uh, a higher resolution. And this, is, uh, this image shows the message clearly. So that if you have a conformal, uh, uh, confocal microscopy, four pi microscopy, uh, or state microscopy, you will see that in two, these two cases, the state microscopy will give you a much better resolution. Uh, and also, if you have uh, another image, which is which is this one and that one, you will see that you will get a much better resolution. Fantastic. So. <clears throat> Uh, 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 it, uh, so far, uh, it, it gives you the possibility to do optical manipulation. You c it gives the possibility to increase the, the, uh, the, uh, uh, mic uh, the resolution in microscope. It gives you the possibility to also to, uh, to sub let's say, uh, uh, subtract the, the background noise in ast astronomy. However, uh, the wide application that uh, people are right now fighting for is the communication. 
So usually we know that in communication, we use photo number, which is how the intensity is changing, or we use the polarization of light for communication. So polarization of light is, is bidimensional. Either it can be edge polarization, repolarization as independent vector, or it can be anti-diagonal, diagonal polarization, or it can be left-handed and right-handed sequel polarization. So essentially, if someone wants to use the uh, orbital polarization degrees of freedom uh, for communication, they can encode only zero and one. This is what most of the people, they use it. Uh, however, you going for orbital momentum gives you the possibility to have access to not only bidimensional space, but getting higher dimensions. For example, these dimension seven. So you can, or if, if I had another, another OM, it can be dimension eight. If it's dimension eight, each of those, let's say I have another one, which is L equal to, uh, let me write it here. So I have L equal also to four. So this is the L equal to four here. So then the number of modes that I have is one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, and eight here. So essentially, by sending only a, a, a signal in one of those cases, I can send three bits of information. For example, this one can be zero, zero, zero. This can be zero, zero, one, zero, uh, one, zero. This can be one, zero, zero. And I, I'm sure that you can go with the rest. So uh, uh, one, zero, one, and, and etc. So one, 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 and one, one, zero. So with sending only one signal, I can send three bits of information. And this is extremely important because those people, they know very well that when you want to handle noises, when you want to reduce the power consumption, this is an excellent approach. Uh, and uh, they, people, they try many in, uh, with different ways. I mean, in Vienna, Anton Zeilinger team, they tried in its uh, free space sending information in three kilometers. Uh, and also in uh, Rome, they try in a, uh, in a, in a hall to send information uh, um, uh, we are combination of uh, uh, orbital momentum and polarization of light uh, uh, in, uh, in a free space channel. And uh, also that has application on, uh, uh, or on, on the quantum photonic side when people they want to send uh, information securely. Uh, this is a, uh, um, uh, one of our works, which is, I think, is uh, uh, the first high dimensional uh, quantum key distribution in real life. So uh, we, uh, in free space actually, which we use uh, the combination of orbital momentum and polarization to send two bits of information in free space. So, uh, uh, and also on the other side, uh, uh, since this gives you the possibility to have access to higher dimensional space or Hilbert space, then uh, um, there is a way that you can do also and you can perform some sort of quantum simulation. So you can simulate complex quantum system. For example, spin of photon, that can be associated to the spin of uh, our map on the spin of electron, because both of them they are uh, uh, bidimensional. Uh, uh, I say electron, yes, spin of electron. And also you can use the OM space as discrete unbounded Hilbert space. This is, a, uh, I think, one of the first work uh, doing the quantum simulator uh, with, with uh, a structure wave or structural light, which what we have done in that work, we were able to couple a, a spin to orbital momentum. So essentially building up a quantum walk. And in the quantum walk, the quantum object or quantum uh, particle, they, uh, it, does, uh, um, it does action based on interaction with, with, uh, uh, with, let's say, a magnetic field or uh, doing interaction based on the spin state. And here also the uh, orbital momentum value of the particle or the photon in this case 
it changes according to, to the spin state, according to the polarization state. And there was a device that uh, was invented in Napoli and I contributed to the, uh, to the invention as well at that time. Uh, 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 um, uh, it was used to couple spin and orbit and minimum degrees of freedom and giving the possibility that someone can do uh, a specific quantum work with it. For example, these are uh, the simulation and experimental results of wave packet dynamic. So we created a specific wave packet, let's say in a lattice of, at uh, of uh, atom. So there was an electron distribution, which by the way, this is a quantum simulator. It means that it's simulating a co specific quantum states or specific quantum system. And here, though we are dealing with photon, but we can say the word of electron or atoms because there is a one-to-one -one mapping between the, 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 the two different quantum systems. So essentially, we created a, a, a specific distribution for, uh, for electrons in a lattice of atom. And then according to the Bloch vector that electron has, we were able to simulate what is happening with the dynamics of the wave packet upon discrete time. So this is the time, essentially, and we can look at the wave packet dynamics and you will see that if, if, the, uh, if the block vector of the electron for the spin is chosen in a specific fashion, then the dynamics of the electron uh, wave packet is changing. So it's going, let's say, to a specific lattice on the, at the edge of the lattice, and then if you choose a spec another specific vector, you will see that you uh, the, the electron distribution will stay in the same place. However, the, you do have a dispersion and there will be a widening in the distribution of the electron charges. So uh, uh, this was fantastic. And also, I think two years ago, we did a simulation of, the first simulation of uh, a cyclic quantum system. So uh, with that, um, I, I will close the introductory part. And now we will go into deep calculations, uh, not deep calculation, a little bit of calculation and seeing uh, some, let's say, detail uh, uh, physics there. Is there any question, guys? Well, I have one. Absolutely. Okay. So this is, this is regarding the uh, uh, doing QKD, uh, key distribution with OAM modes. Yes. Uh, so, uh, question is, uh, well, we know this BB84 or ECAT92 that is based on polarization and polarization is a two dimensional basis, but yes. OAM intrinsically is like infinite dimensional basis. And, uh, you know, for any practical implementation, let's say if you choose some eight modes or nine modes or some finite number of modes from the OAM basis, but the Hilbert space is infinite dimensional. So how does that affect the, you know, actual security and stuff, especially when, you know, somebody is doing, for example, that you have done it over, you know, uh, 200 meters or uh, kilometers. And in the actual uh, atmosphere, you may have an L equal to one mode breaking up into uh, a mode that is beyond that subspace. So how does then the security and other stuff, uh, you know, how, how does it affect those? Uh, absolutely, absolutely. We will, uh, Anand, if you allow me, we, we will discuss about that, uh, uh, on Friday, because on Friday I will have, let's say, the whole talk associated to uh, to quantum key distribution, Excellent. and we will discuss about many of those problems. I mean, first of all, I mean, you raise a, a very uh, important point: how is the security analysis going on uh, for higher dimension? What what is going on essentially? What I gained? We will discuss about that and we will see what, uh, what are the benefits, okay? Excellent, okay. And, and then you are totally right. You do have specific in the free, sp specifically speaking, the free space propagation. We have uh, what we call it vortex splitting. And vortex splitting will cause issues. Either, if, uh, either you have to compensate for that or you have to handle it properly, okay? Yeah, we will discuss about that uh, if you allow me on, on Friday. Okay. Perfectly fine, perfectly fine. Beautiful. Okay. Abhinand? Abhinandan, yeah. Abhinandan, yes. Go ahead. I have a, a very similar question like Anand uh, regarding that uh, QKD uh, slide. So, shall I ask now or like wait for later? Uh, 
So uh, tell me the question. If the question is deep, then uh, we'll discuss it on Friday. Okay. If it's not, no, yeah. this is uh, like straightforward. Uh, so in this uh, protocol or whatever I have shown, in that I think you have used a uh, OAM as well as polarization. This vector uh, vortex moves. Yes. Uh, so point is that uh, why you require this uh, particular uh, task can be done with also high dimensional OAM modes. So why uh, polarization is also required? Is there any additional benefit that it uh, gives? Yeah. So uh, I've been undone. Is there, are you experimentalist? Yes. Okay. Good. Let me let me go in into the experimentalist language. Uh, you know that we have a mode, right? When you go and doing free space quantum communication, free space classical communication, doesn't matter. Uh, uh, you have a specific lens, right? The telescope yes. that sends yes. the information, a telescope that receives the information. True? Yes. Beautiful. I love OM and I love to have more OM there. But there is a problem. If I send OM, the beam dimension will increase, right? And it scales yes. up either with square root of L or with L, depending on the mode that you use. And the other side, the telescope will not receive the entire the beam if you go to certain values, higher than certain okay. values. Okay? So uh, then you will ask yourself, hey, I'm sending, I, I want to use a higher dimension, but I see that there is a threshold there, which is the numerical aperture of entire the system. The telescope that is sending, of course, the turbulence plays role, which is, you know, free parameter and, and uh, distortion there, but also on the other side, you have another telescope. So this optical system has a certain numerical aperture. So if the beam goes higher than certain values, then it will not be captured by the other one, okay? Then, okay you are limited to certain OM values for sending the information. And by the way, if I want to be very careful, also we have the P mode. And no one talked about P mode until the work of uh, Enrico Santamata and myself in 2012, okay? Which we showed to the people, look, P radial mode is extremely important because if you want to send more information more securely and using the optimal cases, then you have to go with the Schmidt mode of the system. And the Schmidt mode of the system is dictated not by all L and only, but also with the P. So yes. your LP is fixing the number of modes, the spatial mode that you can send it. But on the top of this, I have another degrees of freedom. Another degree of freedom for me is polarization. Whatever mode that I'm sending, if I include the polarization, it will be double, okay? This yes. is the benefit. This is the benefit of using the polarization on the top of OM because without changing the, let's say, the, the numerical aperture, playing with the numerical aperture issues, you multiply the, this amount of information that you send by two. Okay, thank you. Another okay. question uh, is that uh, effect of turbulence is same for like this vector vortex beam and only OM modes or is there any robustness benefit that comes into picture? We will talk about that. They are identical. <laughs> okay. Yes, they are okay. identical for both of them. Okay, thanks. Okay. Uh, I, I was among the people that at first I thought otherwise, but then uh, I corrected myself. So if you do the calculation, you will see the vector vortex modes also is, uh, is a coherence proposition of two different OM values and two, let's say, having different polarization. But essentially, phase is phase. So if you, the turbulence is affecting the phase, is affecting the phase of uh, uh, OM beam. And since the, uh, since the vector vortex mode also is a superposition of different OM values, both of them, they are affected differently. And uh, consequently, then uh, the, the, the entire vector vortex mode also is affected. Okay, so it is the only benefit of numerical aperture that is, uh, that's why you are using uh, polarization and OM both. So that's the only benefit. Yes, because, because we have a numerical aperture limit. So okay. if, if you pay attention, 
to, to, to the statement that I have for OM, I don't say that OM will give you infinite alphabet. I say that it gives you unbound alphabet. Okay? Yes. And the bond essentially is dictated by numerical aperture. Yes. Okay. okay. Good. Thanks. Sirenu? <laughs> Hello. Yes. Hello. So, what are the limitations of using SLM in implementing communications? Oh, uh, we will talk about SLM and uh, in the uh, next slides. And uh, uh, we will definitely discuss about that. SLM has problems, okay? Uh, we will discuss about it and I will tell you at that time. Is that fine? Okay, okay, it's fine. Good. Ruchi? Yeah. I, I just have a question based on that uh, QKD. You have uh, sh uh, used vector vortex beam where polarization across the beam cross section is only linear. But then if you have a Poincare beams where you do have elliptical state of polarization as well, do you feel they will offer uh, like more benefit with respect to vector vortex beam or they will have a similar effect? No, it's, it's exactly similar. It's exactly similar. Okay, okay, yeah. Okay. Uh, there, there is no, there is no essentially benefit on uh, uh, modes are modes, and both of them or all of them, they are affected by the turbulence. Uh, the the way that they are affected is might be a little bit different depending on the value of the turbulence. I mean, it being strong or weak, uh, uh, but essentially all of them they are affected. Okay, but uh, uh, in one of the paper from our research group. They have shown like uh, Poincare beams are more robust than the vector vortex beam. No, I, I don't believe so. We have done this sort of experiment and I have not seen that. Okay, okay, yeah, thanks. Because at the end, I mean, <laughs> if you look at the Poincare beam as well, I mean, these lemon star and, and moon star topology, essentially what is happening, uh, uh, you have a superposition of uh, Gaussian beam with the uh, uh, but not for Monstar, by the way. Monstar is a different story. Lemon and Star, uh, or other type of Poincare beams, you have a Gaussian uh, uh, component, and the Gaussian component also is affected by the turbulence. It, 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 uh, this might not be, I don't know who, uh, who men did you mention? That's a paper in PRA. Uh, by whom? By uh, Sentu Kumar and Kedar Kare. Okay, I, do, I, I, I have not talked to them, I would, uh, uh, I, and I don't know the experiment or the theory. Uh, That's experiment. Is experiment. So definitely this is not apple to apple comparison because the turbulence, uh, can, it, it is different. And the level of turbulence, you will see it on the uh, Friday talk, it depends on uh, many parameters, okay? You can have a medium, weak and strong turbulence. In the strong turbulence, good luck, nothing will happen. Okay, you can even not send information. In the medium and, and weak turbulence, maybe at the weak turbulence, the Poincare beam has a little bit of advantages, but if you go to the strong, uh, let's say medium turbulence, then all of them, they are affected. Okay. We have, I send me the paper, I will look at that and then I will tell you my thoughts on this. Okay, sure, sure. This doesn't mean that I'm invalidating the work of other people. <laughs> I'm sure that I'm sure that what they have done, uh, it is right, but you have to look at the content, okay? Good, so uh, let's go with, with Maxwell equations, okay? Uh, I'm sure that you know these Maxwell equations, which is for free space. Uh, and essentially, uh, what we are working with is a, is a monochromatic wave. Uh, okay, so uh, you, we, we will get wave equation, and then we assume that we have a monochromatic wave, and finally, what we will get, we will get Helmholtz equation. And, uh, uh, and essentially the solutions that we get the, is, is the solution to, um, to the wave equation, okay? Fine, and then uh, we will get different solutions uh, to the Helmholtz equation, which is uh, plane wave, Bessel modes, Matthew modes, and et cetera. 
but recall that it, 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 uh, those solutions, they have, a, um, um, uh, they are not power normalized, okay? They are not power normalized. And the issue is that if you integrate it, uh, if you integrate, if you look at the energy, you will see the energy is almost infinite for, for the entire of the space, okay? And this is a serious, serious problem, all right? And for the people, uh, for people that they, uh, they work, uh, uh, let me just go back. For you guys, I know that uh, you, uh, you like, um, uh, you like uh, high energy physics, or let's say if you're going to the relativistic regime, um, I can say to you that if you define a new vector, which is F is equal to E plus I, is an imaginary number of CB, which is what we call a Riemann Silberstein uh, uh, vector. And rewriting the, uh, rewriting the Maxwell equation, essentially what you will get, you will get the, the following expression for, uh, for, uh, uh, for the uh, Riemann Silberstein equation, which is R, I, uh, um, alpha mu derivative with respect to mu of F of uh, equal to zero. And, and uh, if you compare these to an alpha mu is a, is a, a spin one, uh, 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 spin one power matrices. If I want to write it, I have to be a little careful. So let's write that one. So alpha zero is equal to identity matrix of three alpha one is equal to if I remember well, gosh, it is zero, 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 zero. I think that it should be uh, no, zero, I, I, zero, zero. And the rest also, you can, you can build it up based on that. Uh, um, and, and if you compare these to, to Dirac equation, essentially for Dirac equation, you will have I, uh, let's go with a, uh, with a, um, uh, with a unit, uh, with uh, with uh, we um, uh, choosing the unit such a way that h bar and c they are equal to one, then uh, you will get uh, the same expression, which is gamma mu derivative with respect to mu of uh, 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 minus m, and then you have the psi, which is equal to zero. This is the Dirac equation that usually you get it. If you introduce the riemann silberstein you will get this expression for. Uh, for the riemann silberstein vector, which is very similar to Dirac equation. Uh, the only difference is that here you don't have mass and the, the rest mass essentially. So uh, I, I have to be careful sometimes when I, I talk to people and in quantum optics field, we usually we talk about uh, wave function. And I say that the wave function of photon and many times I, I use this for. So uh, we have to be very careful because essentially photon uh, uh, wave function is not solution to the Schrodinger equation and the wave function is defined for the Schrodinger equation. However, by using these uh, tricks, people, they can say that look, hey, apart from the transversality, which is excluding the spin of zero, uh, then the rest of the equation, if you write the riemann silberstein equation is very similar to the Dirac equation for a massless particle excluding the zero spin due to the transversality of the electric and magnetic field. So uh, then it allows us somehow to use this phrase of uh, wave equation for, uh, uh, for photon. So uh, these are the examples that we do have for, uh, um, let's say a wave equation, this uh, explicit one, which is a Bessel function. And remember this is a solution to the wave equation is not power normalized. And for Bessel function, if you integrate the energy that you have it on a specific ring is identical to energy that you have it in the other ring as well, okay? And uh, uh, this is one of the property. Uh, you will see, uh, you know, zero intensity here and you have zero intensity here and many of those zero intensities, which is showing as 
an additional, uh, by the way, I've forgotten the row here. Uh, this is showing uh, uh, another degrees of freedom, which defines what is going on with the transfer wave function. So far, we only talk about L, which tells us what's going on with the phase gradient on azimuthal direction. However, we have another term which will tell us what is going on with the radial distribution of these. And this can be uh, solved for the, uh, uh, the case of wave equation. And this is what you will see. And whenever you have a zero intensity, for example, zero intensity here, definitely there is a phase jump from one region to another region. So you will see that in a, there is another zero intensity, there is a phase jump there. So uh, uh, think in this way, intensity, uh, you have the intensity distribution and whenever there is a zero intensity, it shows to you that the, the, uh, there is a jump between the two uh, part of the intensity. So there is a jump between this part which has intensity and there is a, this uh, part of intensity. So there is a, let's say, uh, the, the amplitude changes the phase and the amplitude, if it changes the phase, then this is associated to a negative sign in the amplitude, which is a, identical to a phase jump of pi here. Uh, this is true even when you focus light. When you focus light, you will see, for example, through a, a, a circular aperture, you will get a pattern. And if you look at the area pattern, you will have a central intensity and then multiple rings around that. And there also we have a phase singularity uh, region or and that region is a phase jump essentially. So this is another way of looking at the singularities uh, or phase singularities. However, uh, in the laboratory, we are not dealing with a wave equation. Uh, 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 what we are dealing with is, is what we call it partial wave equation. So this is the wave equation that we, we, uh, we just discussed. And we assume that our beam is propagating along a specific direction of Z, but still is varying in Z, okay? And if you replace it there, you will get this equation. I'm sure that you have done that. However, when you reach to this equation, most of the people, they say that, look, in the partial regime, this term is, uh, uh, um, is the contribution that you will get it from this term is much stronger than this term. So the beam essentially along propagation direction does not change the amplitude significantly. That's the reason that the second derivative will be, uh, will be omitted in the calculation. This is what they call it partial wave equation. However, I always prefer to work in the dimensionless coordinate, which the beam size is given by W naught. So I assume that the beam has a certain, let's say, size in, 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 in the transverse plane, which is given by W zero. And then along propagation direction, you have another measure, which is the Rayleigh range. And the Rayleigh range will dictate what's going on there. And if you write this equation in a dimensionless coordinate, then you will get uh, the following equation. So you will have derivative with respect to transverse in the dimensionless coordinate. Then you have derivative with respect to Z and second derivative with respect to Z. However, the coefficient that you have it here, the coefficient for uh, derivative, uh, the second derivative of uh, Z is given by lambda divided by pi W naught power of two. So essentially this is one divided by 10, roughly speaking of lambda divided by W0 power of two, okay? So uh, usually what we are dealing with is that the wavelength of the light is almost about 0 0.5 micrometer and the beam size that we are dealing usually is about one millimeter, okay? And you will see that this term is extremely small. If you deal with a beam which the the beam size is order of millimeter. However, the paraxial regime will be uh, invalidated if the beam size is, is in the range of the wavelength, okay? So for example, if you are considering a beam with a beam, uh, let's say a, a, a green beam or green laser with a beam size which is order of two wavelength, then the paraxial regime is not valid. Is not valid. 
So you have to consider the entire uh, of, uh, of uh, uh, wave equation. And this is extremely important. So let me give you an example. When you do tight focusing, when you do tight focusing, partial regime is not valid anymore. Okay? Clear, guys? Yes. Beautiful. Yeah, okay. So we have the partial wave equation in the dimensionless coordinate, or you can write it in or write it back in in a, in a, in, a, in a standard domain, a standard coordinate that you choose. Standard, they have to be careful. And uh, the solutions for partial wave equation, they can be Hermit Gaussian modes, they can be Lagrange Gaussian modes, Inch Gaussian modes, hypergeometric Gaussian modes, hypergeometric modes, and many, many others. So essentially, you can solve it in 11 different coordinates, depending on the symmetry that you have and the solution that you are looking for. For example, in my thesis, my PhD thesis, I wrote in a way that there is a similarity with Schrodinger equation. And I look for, let's say I have a specific, let's say weight packet solutions. And I found, I think 10 uh, different solutions out of these Schrodinger equation. Uh, uh, and assuming that they are complete basis or they are not complete basis, they are all complete basis and many other properties. However, those solutions that people, most of the people they consider, uh, uh, and for example, Hermit Gaussian is, is a solution in the Cartesian coordinate, like Gaussian modes in, in uh, cylindrical coordinate, in Gaussian, uh, 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 in Gaussian is in elliptical coordinate. And for example, this one is orthogonal modes. They form orthogonal modes, uh, like Gaussian mode as well. In Gaussian modes, they form also orthogonal mode. And also they are complete bases. All right. This is the case of like Gaussian mode. Okay, this is the case of L equal to one. And for L equal one, you will see that uh, for uh, you have another index, uh, indices, which is uh, usually we like like Gaussian modes with P and L, uh, which P will define the radial part and L defines the azimutal index. And uh, that is given by, uh, let's say, uh, the, 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 the real space parameters R, and this is phi. And there are uncertainty relationship, although for radial part is extremely difficult. I try very hard with, in several papers, to, to show that what is the radial quantum feature. Uh, uh, but remember that uh, azimutal, as we discussed, defines uh, what is going on with uh, the, the phase jump, essentially this L equal to zero, you will see that is uniform in phase, here it will equal to one, then you will have a change in phase in this direction, zero to two pi, L equal to two, you have zero to two pi, two pi to four pi jump. And also radial part, as you see, that it allows you to distribute the, uh, the, uh, the photon or the light mode in, in the, along the radial direction. For example, for P equal to one, you have an additional ring of intensity here. This is not depending on the OM value. This is comp it doesn't have orbital momentum. And as we discussed, the central part has, a, for example, if it has a zero, pi, a zero phase, the, definitely the ring has a pi jump, okay? And at P equal to two, you will see that you have three rings, uh, the two rings and one intensity at the center. P equal to three, two, three, also the same scenario. You will see that an additional ring will appear. However, you can have a beam with that case, orbital momentum of L, let's say L value, and also different P states. For example, this is L equal to one and P equal to two, and etc. So uh, this is what I mean by numerical aperture. So assuming that you have a specific numerical aperture, uh, let me just erase those, uh, uh, let's say, lines and showing to you. So this is assuming that this is my numerical aperture that I have here, okay? You see that I can handle L equal to zero and P equal to, very likely P equal to one. I cannot handle even P equal to two. So P equal to zero, L equal to zero, 
is one mode that it will fit in my system. P equal to zero, sorry, P equal to one, L equal to zero is another mode. If you, I have the same aperture here as well, then I can handle also P, L equal to one, P equal to zero, L equal, P equal to, uh, L equal to one, P equal to one. And for that one, even I cannot handle uh, a P equal to one. So the only thing that I can handle is L equal to two and P equal to zero. So essentially for, for this specific numerical aperture, I can only handle six modes, uh, sorry, five modes. And uh, uh, that is an issue essentially, okay? Uh, th that's the reason that I cannot use the entire the OM space. Good, if I want to simplify in, uh, um, oh, there are typos, my apologies. Continuous is typo, discrete also is typo. E-T-E, E-T-E, -E. okay. And the continuous as well, this, this, this is a typo. Access. Can I ask a question, please? Yes. Like in the previous slide, as you were mentioning, your numerical aperture is actually limiting the OA mode. Which you limiting the modes. Right. But then if you, uh, if we work with perfect optical vortex beam, where you're actually the beam diameter is independent of the, uh, independent of the topological charge, or let's say the mode values, L values, will there also the same effect will be there? Meaning optical vortex beam, you mean? Yes, perfect one, where the ring diameter is constant. Or it does not change with the L value. Are you sure that there is this beam? Yes, there are many papers with perfect optical vortex beams. No, it doesn't exist. Because yes. I mean, this, this is the nature of the diffraction. Okay. Definitely you do have some intensity around it. You, ca you cannot have that. Okay. okay. You can you cannot have a beam which uh, is is constant in intensity and is propagating. Okay. Mm -hmm. Definitely, you have a diffraction. Yes. Yes. Yeah. If you have a diffraction, then on the other side, you you cancel it out. Okay. Yeah, but, but the point is that we I I should not be able to distinguish those modes. But for example, I can have still the same numerical aperture here. Let's call it here. Okay. This is the same numerical aperture, but I'm cutting this region. If I'm cutting this region, this is not any more the same mode. It's a different absolutely, mode. Absolutely, absolutely, yes. Okay, and uh, for sure, if you look at those uh, perfect vortex beam or perfect uh, uh, beams that they call, definitely they have a range, okay? People, they, cre yes. they create Bessel beams, right? In the laboratory, right. you create Bessel beams. They are not Bessel beams, essentially they are Bessel Gaussian beam. In a spe specific region, you do have a Bessel beam, okay? Right. Yeah. Uh, uh, Suman? Yes, uh, I have a question regarding this thing. So, uh, as you said that numerical aperture, so it seems that P modes divergence is uh, higher than OM modes, is it? Means I'm just looking here that uh, divergence means uh, not divergence, the size of the P modes seems L equal to zero, P equal to three, means when just goes to the p equal to 3 it takes complete of the circular aperture part and similarly means one thing i just want to ask you that let's say you are sending p equal to 3 l equal to 0 p equal to 3 but your numerical aperture is restricted to that can allow only p equal to 1 so as you said that if your uh, numerical aperture is small enough that it cannot take the p equal to 3 then if you are sending p equal to 3 then uh, you are cutting something of the beam. Then, to, yes. uh, then definitely it will show some error in the detection, isn't it? Yeah, it's a, it, 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 exactly. The, the issue is that you properly stated. So I can, I can, I can send all of those beams, right? Yes. But on the other side, I will, I will get a truncated beam. And when I get a truncated beam, the modes, they are not anymore the pure modes. They have a cross talk with each other. So yes. if I send P equal to three, L equal to two, then I only select this part. If I, with this, this region, 
definitely I will have a cross section with P equal to two. I have a cross section with P equal to one and, and et cetera, okay? Okay. This is a significant problem that you have and you are totally right. And uh, honestly speaking, I tried very hard with my friends, uh, as I say that we were among the first, we were the first people looking at the radial mode because we believe that this is the advantages that you have essentially the number of modes that you will get is 2p plus absolute value of l plus one as you may know by the GUI phase this is the number of modes that you can be sending uh, in a specific numerical aperture and the limit will be on l and p uh, but uh, uh, but uh, there is an uncertainty relation so for example if the truncation or let's say the cut happens in the beam like this then the om value will be affected the cut if it happens on the radial part like this or like that, that affects the P value. Okay, so there is an uncertainty principle that what is the phi, okay, and what is L, and there is an uncertainty, which I call it delta P, delta, I don't call it R, but I call it delta, uh, I think in my notes, I always, I call it uh, psi, such a way that uh, the disk psi is, is something very complicated in function of R, then there is always an uncertainty relation between them. So what is that conjugate of that P? Means just like delta L, delta phi, and as you said, that's C. Yeah, yeah, it, it, it is something of a complex function of uh, rho, okay? I see. For, for phi is easy because phi, if you remember the LZ operator, if we yeah. had, uh, uh, the LZ operator was given by I H bar minus sign of derivative respect to phi is, is the first uh, derivative operator. For P uh, operator is very complicated. For P operator is, is second order derivative, uh, if I remember by heart, is one divided by R uh, derivative with respect to R of R, derivative with respect to R minus M L power of two absolute value plus one divided by four, uh, one divided by R square, something like that, if I remember from my heart. I'm, it's, it's an optics letters paper in 2012. You can look at that expression and uh, uh, several PRA paper at, at that time, okay? Okay, okay thank you. Okay, apart from the typos guys, for, my apologies, just forget the typos. <laughs> okay, so um, light has linear momentum as we discussed, and linear momentum can be in any specific direction. So it's unbounded essentially. It can have a, a vectorial nature, which is polarization of light. We talked about that. It's bidimensional, it can only take two values. It can carry orbital angular momentum, uh, which is a discrete quantity unbounded, which is related to the phase nature. It has also radial uh, mode, and the radial mode is associated to how the intensity and phase in the radial direction is, uh, is distributed. And essentially, when I'm dealing, I'm not talking about the quantum optics side, which is the photon statistic and other stuff, and indeed, at the end, what I'm dealing with is a very complicated uh, 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 system, which is a K vector, which is polarization, which is orbital momentum, which is also uh, the, the, the radial index. So essentially, I'm dealing with this system, K, pi, O, and P, you can you have a coherent superposition of all of those or incoherent superposition of these. So this is the entire of the photon Hilbert space, okay? I think, uh, and, and, uh, and this is what I mean by uh, structured photons, you can have a very complicated situation. You can have different OM, different radial modes, different polarization, and at the end, you, in the classical regime, you can create a laser beam which has these complicated pattern. The pattern 
uh, point by point has a different sequel polarization state. Some places is linear polarization in this direction, some places is linear polarization in that direction, some places is linear polarization in this direction or that direction. And uh, in some other places you have elliptical polarization and on the top of these, what you have, you have different intensity distribution as well. So here is brighter, here is lower, here is zero intensity and etc. This is what I call it structured light. Or if you go and doing the photonic state, then you will get structured photon with that. Good. Anand, do I have time or should I stop here? Uh, up to you. I think we are enjoying. So I think <laughs> so. I'm, I'm available until 10 uh, of my time, which is next 18 minutes. I'm available. Fine. We can continue. Okay. Fine. Okay. Good. Uh, any question, guys? Okay, let's go to the generation. Now, uh, look, I'm going through what we discuss in details now. I mean, we are going even deeper and deeper. It's not uh, going always through the tutorial way because I told that most of the people, maybe they, know, they don't know about these physics. So anyway, when we go with partial wave equation, essentially, as we discussed, we are dealing with this equation Laplacian of uh, transverse Laplacian plus uh, I think uh, 2ik derivative with respect to z of uh, electric field component. So E of uh, tr R transverse and um, uh, z equal to zero. This is, if you write it down, this is very similar to Schrodinger equation. I would, I would prefer even to write it in, uh, in uh, dimensionless coordinates. Okay. So in the dimension, this coordinate will be 4i derivative with respect to zeta of electric field of R transverse and zeta and equal to zero. You can write it like minus one divided by four of Laplacian of psi of electric field acting on uh, mm, mm -hmm. I derivative to zeta of E. Okay, do you agree, guys? Can I write this as a Hamiltonian of E equal to I derivative respect to zeta of E? Is this familiar to you guys? This exactly look like Schrodinger equation. The only thing that is changed that zeta is replaced by, and time is replaced by zeta. So you can use exactly the same approach that we learned, finding the unitary action and, 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 and doing the evolution, not in time, but evolution in z. And if you do that, what is happening that usually we say that we have an initial wave function, which is given by E of R uh, uh, transverse and zeta, zero, that is created at a given space, given z direction, given time, if you want to call it, then you can look and find the kernel of the propagation. This is exactly look like the time kernel propagation that we do have in quantum mechanics. And then you can find the field at any given time or given space. And if you do that, you will understand that it's extremely easy and this propagator essentially for parallel regime is given by the Fresnel propagation, uh, Fresnel propagator. So the kernel, you can find it out and you can find it in many textbooks. But there is a similarity between the Schrodinger equation and that one. And usually I prefer to write it in this way. What is important that the amplitude and phase, they play a significant role. Essentially, this, a, a, this is a unitary action. So essentially, if you define a specific amplitude at the given plane, then that defines uniquely a specific state or specific amplitude and phase at any given plane. Okay, remember that. So it's a unitary action, and the Hamiltonian is given, it's a free space, a free particle, whatever if you want to call it. Uh, as soon as you define in a specific time or specific plane, then you know what's going on with that. And this is unitary, so it's one-to-one -one mapping always. 
So this is the approach that we use. In order to create any beam in the parallel regime, what we have to do, we have to create it at the given plane. This is what we call it, creating it at the pupil function, uh, pupil. And uh, uh, the, the approach is like that. For example, if you remember the holographic approach that we use, and uh, we talk about the pitchfork hologram, and we say that if you, uh, if, you, uh, if you create the beam in a given plane, then you create the beam at any other planes as well. And the approach that people they use is spatial light modulator, because we want to create a beam at any given plane or at a given plane. With a spatial light modulator, what you do is a liquid crystal uh, technology, and point by point, we have the possibility to control the phase of the beam. So essentially, these are, I'm watching from this side is a cross section, is a liquid crystal uh, device. When you enter to the system, by applying the electric field here, I can control what is going on with the phase of the beam. So the phase will be controlled, e power of i, chi will be controlled for me by applying the voltage. So this chi is depending on the voltage that I'm applying to, to the system. And this is one of the special light modulator. It's 16 by 16 uh, pixel. And this is another one from, uh, from Hamma, uh, I think this is from Boulder. Yes, it's from Boulder, is a, is a high resolution technique, okay? And the first thing that we should know that, good, I'm able to control the phase of the beam, but everything that I'm controlling, although the spacing between the each pixel, it's, is, it can be minimized, but still everything is discrete, is not a continuous. So the control in the phase that I have it is discrete quantity, is ij, okay? And the phase can be going from zero to two pi, uh, or it can be going to multiple pi's, okay? The, or it can be below two pi's, which is what we, we call it as a phase modulation. So those are the deficiencies of the SLMs. This is a structure how that SLM works. So essentially you have a liquid crystal. If you don't apply any voltage to it, okay? And by the way, this is the gap between the pixels. This is one pixel. This is the second pixel. This is the third pixel, okay? And by applying the voltage there, when the light is coming in, if I don't apply any voltage, the liquid crystal, uh, they are oriented planet to the surface, then the light will see higher refractive index. And then when it's reflected back, it exits much uh, uh, later. If you apply voltage, let's say 2.5 volt, then liquid crystal, they are tilted. Then the light will see a lower refractive index and then exits a little bit earlier from the system. Oh, sorry a little bit earlier from the system. If you apply higher voltage, then the liquid crystal, they are bended completely. Then even lights will see a much lower refractive index, and then it exits much earlier. So with this approach, I am able to control the phase from this value, which is zero, to this value, which can be two pi. The optimal case will be two pi in a step fashion, which the step fashion is dictated by the bits of your computer and usually it's 256 level. So zero to two pi, if I look at the plot of the phase, which is, is the phase, uh, it steps as, let's say two pi divided by 256. Those are the steps that you get it. Look at crystals. As you know from the name is liquid, the way that they respond to the electric field uh, is, is by the dipole moment of them. And usually you apply an AC with a specific frequency and then you can switch them. It seems like, a, you know, doing an oscillation effectively is an AC, but effectively the liquid crystal, they will orient in a specific direction. Then you can switch the, the voltage 
and then these lipid crystals they start to tilt in a, in another way. The way that they are switching uh, is slow, and this is one of the deficiencies of the liquid crystal. Uh, and uh, the 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 maximum speed that they can get for specific liquid crystal. I mean, we have different clostrolic, limatic, and uh, uh, liquid crystal for specific case is about one uh, kilohertz and not more than that. So liquid crystal has or SLM has a problem. One is the speed, which is limited to below kilohertz. The one that usually we get it is about 60 hertz to 100 hertz, not more than that. But in some cases, you can get even about uh, 500 hertz. They are pixelated, okay? And also the phase modulation is a step function, which is dictated by the gray level scale that you write, okay? So uh, if you remember, I say that if you look at the phase singularities, and essentially you can get one of those holograms, which is the pitchfork hologram, and if you shine the Gaussian beam on top of this, most of the people, they say in the past that you create uh, like a Gaussian balls. And it, uh, these are the simulation that I have done in 2006. And you can see that uh, if you look at the intensity profile, now that you know that the, it, uh, the radial mode also plays role, you will see that intensity at the uh, really near field, uh, it changes, it had many, many oscillations in the radial part. And upon propagation, uh, as long as you reach to the radar range, uh, it becomes look like a ring, okay? When I see this puzzle, and, and this is the near field, by the way, near field pattern, just very close to the hologram that you create. And the hologram is a uh, standard pitch for hologram. So it's this one, okay? This is the standard pitch for hologram that you will see it in books or in, in, in articles. Uh, the first thing that I noticed from this is that this is shape in uh, this is not shape invariant. So you will see the intensity from this part, it's changing multiple rings appears and finally at the far field becomes a single ring. If it's a Lagos Gaussian mode, it should be shape invariant. This is not. I have done a little bit of calculation and I, what, uh, what I got that this is a new type of partial beam, which I called hypergeometric Gaussian modes. It's power normalized. They are not shape invariant. They are not orthogonal. Nevertheless, they are all complete bases. So they form, a comp uh, they form a complete base, but they are not orthogonal. So essentially any beam can be expanded in terms of these. And you have, in addition to uh, L values, you have an additional uh, radial number, which is this radial number, I call it by P. But remember this P is different from the P of uh, Lagri Gaussian mode, okay? Then, then I asked myself, good. Then if we are not able to create Lager Gaussian mode with a pitch fork hologram, and we are creating a new type of beam, which we, we call it a hypergeometric, then how can we create other beams? Remember, what we do essentially in the, in the pitch fork hologram case, we have a Gaussian beam as an input, and the hologram action will be imparting e power of minus or plus i l phi to the beam. And then you have to do the Fresnel propagator, okay? You do the Fresnel propag propagation, and then you will get hypergeometry Gaussian modes. Essentially, the hologram imparts only a phase quantity to the beam. But when we are talking about beam like a Gaussian, we are talking about phase and intensity. Which phase and intensity, they are superimposed together. So essentially you have a specific distribution for the intensity and with the phase uh, variation that you wanted. So apart from only paying attention to the phase, I have to also modify the intensity of the beam. Oh, if I want to be careful, I have to modify the amplitude of the beam as well, okay? This is a challenge, and this is what I call it intensity masking. You can look at the many papers in the literature. Most of them, they were wrong. 
And uh, uh, we invented with Enrico, we invented a new approach that people, they can create uh, 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 a, 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 a hologram, which allows you to not only control the phase, but controlling the intensity or amplitude of the beam. The approach is, uh, I can tell you how we came out with this physics, but at the end, the hologram that you will get is not simple pitch for hologram, it's a complicated hologram like that. In specific region, it's not deflecting the light. In a specific region, it's deflecting the light more. In other specific regions, it deflects the light a little bit less, and etc. So it's in homogeneous hologram, essentially. So uh, I, I'm, looking, uh, I'm looking at the mathematics, and I can tell you what I, uh, in two or three minutes, what we are doing is that, uh, uh, Assuming that you have a plane wave coming to an SLM, and SLM, what it does, it controls the phase, but again, you have a sinusoidal, or let's say, uh, a periodic uh, uh, manipulation. And periodic manipulation will have, an, uh, let's say, an argument, and it has an amplitude for the modulation that you apply to it. For example, this can be sinusoidal. Sinusoid is a sign of, let's say, uh, f of, of u and u is the one dimensional or vector dimensional that you can manipulate x and y on the hologram and uh, uh, and this is a periodic function but the amplitude of these also can be modulated m of u okay and remember this goes as a phase so essentially what you have it is e power of i of that modulation that i consider is the uh, is uh, what we call a blaze function. Let's go and erase that just to clear. See, it, this is a mode function, it is a blaze function. It has an argument, it has an amplitude. And I say that I'm considering an arbitrary case. Now, what is happening and what it will be the output of the beam? And uh, uh, definitely due to this phase modulation, I will get an amplitude and, and a phase as, let's say, the first order of diffraction. And I say that this phase, uh, first order of diffraction should have a specific amplitude and a specific phase. And I did the inverse engineering, and I found what is going on with the modulation that you needed to apply to the mask, and what is going on with the argument of the beam that you have to, uh, argument of the function that you have to put it on the hologram. And finally, this is the pattern of the hologram that we got it, but the physics is easy. Since you, apart from the phase, what you want to do, controlling the amplitude. And controlling the amplitude will happen based on the phase variation. So let's see what I mean. A beam is coming in, if you have two pi phase jump perfectly, the beam, all of the beam will be def uh, deflected to the first order of diffraction. But when you don't have a perfectly two pi phase jump, only a portion of the beam is deflected. And in some cases, when you have no modulation, all beam will be transmitted and no deflections here. And if you follow this, you will see that uh, exactly the same amplitude will be imparted to the first order of diffraction. So with this approach, you are able not to engineer the phase structure, but also engineering the amplitude of the beam. Okay? And these are the comparison between different approaches and the software is on the website. If you need the, the software, just uh, send me an email, you will get the link and you can download it. So I will stop it here. Okay? Okay, uh, so that was excellent. I guess you don't have time, so maybe we'll continue with a question on Friday. But just a very quick uh, uh, question, if you still have like a minute or two. Absolutely. Okay, so this looks fantastic. Well, not this slide, but the slide before that, where you have found a new technique for, you know, uh, uh, yes. So this definitely looks fantastic. So you said all the previous methods are kind of wrong. So in, in a sense, I'm happy to kind of, uh, uh, you know, hear that. Because what also you, we were using is something called like Arizona method, which is like kind of the yes. what exactly you want. And then based on that, you kind of generate your amplitude profile, the complex amplitude profile. But the efficiency you get is like 10%, 14%, maximum 10, 12, 14%. What is the efficiency you get in, you know, in, in, in your method? 
Uh, and the efficiency is dictated by the area that you are using the hologram, essentially. Mm -hmm. And uh, yes, the, definitely this approach has a problem. And the problem is the efficiency. Because assuming that you have an unlimited resource for, for the beam, and you are picking up that mode out of it, mm -hmm. okay? So uh, essentially, uh, essentially the, uh, depends on the beam waste that you do have it, depends mm -hmm. on what you want. The efficiency can change, can go even to 40%, but in some cases it, it's as low as you mentioned, about 10% or 20%. Uh, because it's, as I say, it's, it's look like that. Look, I have the entire the intensity here, but my hologram, since it's, it's, it wants to create a specific state, is only located here, okay? So only this part of the beam will be diffracted to the first order of diffraction. So what is happening with the rest, it will go to the zero order of diffraction and they are useless. Okay, so if I understand, maximum efficiency can be up to 40% or so, but, but in- Depending the, on the mode and beam based. Okay, and because I know in the other method, I have never seen the efficiency go more than 15%. I mean, that is a maximum I have seen, no, no matter what the mode and the, what the beam waste I use. Uh, okay, so this so, is- uh, which, which SLMs do you use? I have uh, mostly uh, the one from Holoi. I mean, a lot of pixels, but uh, one from Holoi. Holoi is not bad. Holoi is not bad apart from uh, flickering, which is usually, is if you go really fast, you will see that the liquid crystal is blinking. Uh -huh. they, they, they sell you some stuff to compensate for that, but Hamatsu is a very good one and has better efficiency, honestly. Okay. Uh, no. But with Hamatsu, we were able to get even higher to 40%. You will see it in, in maybe on Friday that we do, when we do quantum optics experiment, uh, that is extremely important as you, you know very well because usually we deal with two photons. If efficiency is dropping by 10 on each side, then the coincidence drops by a, a, a hundred. Mm -hmm. Okay, so no, so, so uh, that's the hardware uh, kind of efficiency, Holoi versus Hamatsu, but, but the algorithm efficiency looks like yours will do much better than the, I mean, I think the uh, other method is this Arizona method, which is kind of more, much more popular, but it, so it looks like it's much better than the Arizona method, no? Yes, it, it, is, it is better than Arizona method. Yeah. So is that, is that published or is it, I mean? Yeah, it, I, I'm sorry, I did not put any references there because it's tutorial. I don't want to promote my work and other people's <laughs> work. So, but uh, yes, in, 2000, uh, in 2013 and 2014, but if you go to the website, there are references there, okay? Oh. And okay. even the software are available. I mean, if someone wants to have it, we have written in LabVIEW code and maybe even in MATLAB code some other students. It's a, it's a very complicated one because honestly speaking, if you watch the expression, uh, uh, you will see that, oops, sorry. If you see that in order to get the, the function properly, you have to take the amplitude of the beam, okay? Doing the sync inverse function and the sync inverse function is multiple, multi values. So you have to do it in a specific domain and then adding one and putting in the, in the amplitude and the other side for the, uh, for the modulation or argument, you have to go with uh, M, the same value and the phase of the beam that you want to create. So it's a little bit complicated, but, uh, but the, the software are there and uh, I will be more than happy to send it to you. Excellent, excellent. Uh, all right, so I mean, if so, uh, any other quick question, very quick question. I have one quick question. Okay, just one, okay. Okay, uh, is it a D, digital micromirror device is also based on liquid crystals? Oh, no, no, no. DMDs are different. DMDs, they are, uh, the name is clear, is, is, uh, is, is micromirrors, okay? So essentially what they do, they are look like mirrors like that, many of them. They can go from one, uh, one uh, uh, situation to another situation. They will tilt or they will stay like that, okay? What they do, essentially, uh, either they, they send the beam in specific angle or specific direction, or they will reflect the beam, okay? Uh, uh, they are not controlling the phase, remember. They are amplitude uh, uh, holograms, 
how uh, some people uh, in in Bob Boyd's team? I'm not sure that Anand was um, among those people uh, that they did their work. Um, uh, Mohammed Mir Hosseini was one of the, the those people. That what they have done, they use to variate this uh, in such a way that it works like let's say a gray level uh, uh, intensity modulation. So DMDs they are different. They can go even to let's say 10 kilohertz or 20 kilohertz. So the speed is much better, but in terms of efficiency, they are much lower than the phase following. Thank you very much. All right, so I think we'll stop here today. And again, people who have questions, let's uh, you, you can come back on Friday, and then we'll continue from uh, here. So again, uh, let's thank Professor Karimi. Uh, thanks a lot. This was excellent. And then again, we'll see you on Friday. So uh, absolutely, thank you very much. I will see you uh, on Friday. Okay. All right. Uh, Friday at seven thirty. Friday at seven thirty. Yes. yes. Okay. The okay. same. Okay. Thank you. All right. Bye. -bye.